Right. So uh, welcome to the uh, summer uh, solstice edition of the third Thursday uh, monthly inventors gathering. My name is Joe Hirschberger and uh, Robert Reed, our fearless leader, is uh, bicycling across France, but uh, we're here um, inventing in the public in his absence. So um, my name is Joe Hirschberger, and I'm going to be talking about ferrofluids today. So first of all, what is ferrofluid? Well, this is the Wikipedia definition, but in short, it is uh, nanoparticles of ferrous material suspended in a fluid, and in our case, in mineral oil. So that's the the property. The properties of the thing we're dealing with are the mineral oil ferrofluid, and it is um, in it's not mixed with water as most oils do not, um, and it reacts to magnetic field. So those are sort of the the keys to what makes a ferrofluid different from a normal fluid. All right. So I have a short video of Robert introducing ferrofluids. And the easiest way to do this is with a pipe. Right? Now we don't know. Really and it doesn't it doesn't stain glass. So you know, in, inside glass it's safe. But it will want to get out from that. And so Really, a petri dish with a cover is the best way to do this, but I don't have a cover. So we're going to have to be a little careful because it'll want to climb. If it, if it has a path to climb out and get to the magnet, it will. Okay, so if you want to do the open camera up here. See those beautiful little spikes? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very characteristic of ferrous fluid. Okay, and it's it's very slippery. If you feel it with your hands, it's even slipperier than oil because of the magnetic mm -hmm. property. It makes a great lubricant. Those little spikes are energy minimization because of tiny variations in the magnetic field, which then get amplified. So that th there's actually less energy here than in a different system, okay? Mm -hmm. And if I move this away, oh, wow. it can behave differently. So this is, it's its really awesome. magical. I don't actually know why there are more spikes under that surface mm -hmm. than when it's in a stronger field here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't fully understand that. Okay, now the thing is if I, I wanna lift this right away, because if I let this magnet get over there, it yeah. will jump out and mm -hmm. grab the magnet. magnet. And then once you get it, so it's time for me to go get the pizza. Okay. So there you have it. In the easy. All right. So we're going to be talking about three projects today involving ferrofluids. And the main impetus behind ferrofluids for all of these projects is the fact that it doesn't it doesn't involve any moving mechanical parts. So everything is a solid structure and a fluid and perhaps magnetic fields. Um, but that none of those things tend to wear out or break down uh, as a mechanical thing does. Um, so in the case of a check valve, there's typically a, a flapper or a spring or a, some sort of thing that has to mechanically uh, cause the uh, unidirectional behavior of the valve. Um, the goal here is to do so with nothing that can break. Um, and the hope is also that that means that it can be scaled into micro uh, machine level uh, structure. Um, we have yet to prove that, that's still in, among the, uh, the future goals of this project, but um, that's, that's the impetus is uh, zero moving parts. All right, so a basic idea of the structure of the passive uh, ferrofluid check valve is that you have a, a chamber that will hold the bolus you have the, the central ring that you see in this diagram is where the magnet's held. And the idea is that there will be a round bolus that covers that magnet. Basically, the, the ferrofluid is going to be attracted to be in the center of the magnetic field. Um, 
However, we have a small chamber or a small tube that goes to the center of that bolus. And then on the other side, it is completely unconstrained in the output chamber. And so the way this behaves is if air or water or something that doesn't mix with ferrofluid is coming in the inlet, uh, it will push the ferrofluid down the tiny chamber until it gets beyond the center of the bolus. And then it will form a bubble and escape through to the outlet. Um, and that is the uh, the functional, the passing direction of this check valve. Um, in the opposite case, the air pressure will surround the bolus from the outside. And because the, the magnet and the, and the viscosity of the oil will keep it together, it's going to press all of the ferrofluid out the uh, out the channel, and only when it has pushed all the fluid and the entire bolus collapses is the fluid is the air going to be allowed the other direction. And so the goal here is that there is a differential between how much pressure it takes for the cracking or the passing in the pat in the in the intended direction and the collapse, which is where the valve fails and it allows air to go the wrong way. All right. Um, I hope that was a clear enough explanation of how this is intended to work. Um, basically any check valve, the ideal case would be, it takes no pressure for air to pass one direction and it's infinite pressure to pass the other. Uh, but in the real world, it, that's, that's not terribly feasible. Um, and so the goal is just to get the greatest differential of pressure from one way to the other. All right, so this is our team. Uh, Robert Reed is coaching. Uh, I'm technical lead, and we just got a new uh, experimenter, uh, Tripti Pandey. Uh, I'll talk about what she'll be doing a little bit later. All right, this is our experiment setup. We effectively have a, a screw syringe that can apply a fixed pressure. Um, we then have a manometer that can measure the pressure, and then in that same circuit, we have our check valve. So we basically add pressure or add vacuum uh, to one side of the valve in order to measure the effect of our pressure or vacuum on that, uh, on that side of the valve. All right, so some experiments have already been done by Veronica Stuckey in the past, uh, also as part of public invention, but the, I believe this was last year. Uh, so, in her experiments, she had a valve basically of the same formation that we showed in the diagram. Uh, she tried two, two different versions of the experiment, one with a single magnet underneath the valve, uh, or, which basically means that you have a magnetic field that's a torus that is coming out of the end of the magnet and circling back around to the other pole. Um, and in that case, she saw a decent five to one ratio uh, between cracking and collapse pressure. Um, she also did another experiment where she put one magnet on either side. So you have a much more concentrated magnetic field going directly through the valve um, as it passes from one magnet to another. Um, in that case, she saw a worse ratio, but a higher overall pressure. Um, so we wanted to validate that and, and experiment with more variables. Uh, and so the trials that we've done over the last four or five months uh, have included uh, tilting the magnet, uh, using stronger magnets, uh, changing the amount of ferrofluid that we're using, using different size magnets also in the two magnet case. We tried using a conical magnet. We also tried adjusting the magnetic field using a steel plate to make the, the magnetic field asymmetrical. Um, we tried spacing the magnet using an air gap to, to space the magnet away from the valve. Um, tried a lot of different things. Um, I'm sure there are more plenty more variables we could we could change, but uh, that's that's where we are over the last handful of months. And effectively we we validated uh, Veronica's results. Um, we essentially got a broader range across these different experiments. Uh, I think, the biggest thing is that we were able to reproduce her results uh, and in a completely independent implementation, 
and show that the results were pretty similar. And that makes us uh, a lot more confident that the results that she had presented are a valid result. All right, so where are we gonna go from here? We have some ideas for future experiments that involve changing the structure. For instance, we, we noticed that there seemed to be a three-dimensional effect within the valve as we were testing it. So it wasn't very clear because we're looking through sort of a frosted 3D printed plastic, but we noticed that what appeared to be happening is that in some cases, the air was escaping more over the top of the bolus than sort of through the center. And so we want to create a situation where there's actually a 3D bolus. So we're going to make like a high dome version. We also wanted, we noticed that sometimes when we're cracking, some ferrofluid will get pulled into the, into the outlet. And if that's the case, it doesn't allow us to experiment with larger amounts of ferrofluid because if the ferrofluid is pulled into the outlet, then it effectively uh, hasn't, is, it doesn't function as a valve at all because it's just pushing ferrofluid either direction. Um, and also in, in line with that three-dimensional bolus uh, attempt, we would like to put a vent with what we call the vent is the, the output, the start of the output port. Um, we wanna get it uh, as far as possible from the center of the bolus. And so we wanna actually put it at the top corner farthest away from the center of the bolus. Uh, again, in the hopes that as that grows, when air is coming in the inlet, that it does not capture any air, any fluid uh, in that output. All right, so um, our new team member, Tripti Pandey, is going to be responsible for our scaling experiments. So what she's been asked to do is to create a half scale and quarter scale version of this experiment and attempt to recreate the results that we've got, or at least um, we want her to recreate the results that we got with the one-to-one -one scale to ensure that she's got the test set up working, et cetera. Uh, but then we also want to see how this uh, valve scales. So that'll be her role. All right, so I think I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions about the check valve. Eric made that comment in the chat. I don't know if you happen to yep, I just, take a look. I just read that. That's great. Yeah, that's also what we were thinking. Uh, that it was just the uh, the very edge that was having an effect. And that's, um, I'm not sure exactly why that results in the data that we saw. Um, but um, well, I guess that, that is interesting. Yeah, it would probably create, right between the two magnets, you'd have a really uniform field. So that that area would null out, but the fringe field would be stronger. Mm -hmm. But that, that's why I would bet that you would have the 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 less directivity because now your effect is further away from the pool geometry that you made. Mm -hmm. Fem would be a really great tool for modeling it. Is that a tool that actually can model ferrofluids? No, but it it's really good at calculating magnetic field of simple magnetic geometries. It's just a two and a half D solver, mm -hmm. but it'll it'll give you those uh, line integrals really easily, and it's free. So, yeah, yeah I believe Robert was uh, was attempting that. Maybe we can get you to uh, to consult with Robert and maybe give him more ideas about because the way that he could leverage that. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. All right, so now I'm gonna go on to the next project. So we're also working on a ferrofluid electromagnetic pump. And we have several concepts for the, this pump, but the first one we're experimenting with is actually going to be a ferrofluid pump. So we're pumping ferrofluid itself, not something else. Whereas the check valve, we're, uh, using the ferrofluid to act as a, a check valve for something else like water or air. Um, so basically we, we have a structure that we had already experimented with 
that used permanent magnets alone. And now we've uh, decided it's time to move to an electromagnet because we need to change the magnetic field and sequences in order to affect a pumping action. Um, so this is the basic structure. Uh, I designed this, this pump in SolidWorks uh, last month. And we've gotten it back, but we have not had a chance to test it yet. I'm still, still working on it. Um, so our team, again, Robert Reed is the coach. I'm the technical lead. And we have a hardware engineer, uh, Jose Oles Goaga. He's in Mexico. And he designed the board that you see here. Um, it's basically seven FETs that control seven electromagnets. And it's got a uh, ESP32 that we can use to control it. All right. So this is the pump sequence, the way that it, it affects a pumping action. So the best way to think of this is to start at step four and the transition um, to, to number one. Essentially, we've got a ferrofluid. So the S represents source, the D represents destination. Um, and we're going to basically take the ferrofluid that's, uh, sorry, for that, the locks are just the same ferrofluid uh, in a cylinder uh, with a permanent magnet. So basically that is ferrofluid trapped at one location and it acts as a lock to the water because the ferrofluid and the water won't mix. So as we change the magnetic fields with the electromagnets to push the water around with other bubbles of ferrofluid, the ferrofluid can pass through the lock because it's not a change of attraction on one molecule of ferrofluid or not, uh, or one particle of ferrofluid, but for the water, it can't mix. So basically, ferrofluid can pass through the lock uh, and the water cannot. So what we're going to do is we start primed with ferrofluid uh, coming from the source lock, and then we separate it in step one with the water. And basically, we're just changing which magnetic, uh, which electromagnets are energized, which is effectively pushing the ferrofluid at the bottom that starts in, if you look at number four, the ferrofluid on the bottom is going to be pulled down to the lowest position, where the top two are going to be energized. So that those two bubbles of ferrofluid are going to be pulled to the top. Then in step two, we continue the sequence one more step, where we push the water even further around by energizing the two ferrofluids near the destination lock and the lower ferrofluid by the source lock. And then finally, in step three, we move the ferrofluid. Uh, we basically are forcing the ferrofluid out. So Essentially, you'll notice that between step three and four, we haven't moved the water on the bottom, but we have moved the water on the top. So that creates a pressure that pushes the ferrofluid from the desk, from that is before the destination lock and puts a vacuum and pulls ferrofluid in from the source lock. So essentially, that bubble of ferrofluid is pushed from the source to the destination. And then if you go around, then it, there's another bubble of ferrofluid that's pushed in another cycle. So that's the way it works. Um, this is sort of, this is a short video of us experimenting with the structure and how the uh, ferrofluid moves within it. So I claim it's gonna jump over here and push that water thing or out the hole. Moving into the lock. How did it hit that way? It ran into the lock and then. Oh, was, okay. It had no. Well, wait, no, that's open. It had no back. So, so that's supposed to be open. So, right. so. So, experimentation. All right. So, um, the status is Jose has completed the des design of the board. We've ordered it. Um, soldered it up. Um, 
I've confirmed that the board can control the electromagnets, and I'm currently in the process of developing control software just to execute the sequence, and we plan to test it next month. So with that, are there any questions about the ferrofluid pump? All right, I will go on to the next one. All right, so the last one is a linear piston or a quote unquote skirt, squirt gun for ferrofluid. And the idea is simply that we have an array of, of electromagnets that we can turn on and off to draw a column of ferrofluid in and out of a cylinder. So we'll have a chamber that's open on one end that will basically push and pull um, ferrofluid. Um, and the goal of this is to basically be able to create another kind of pump where you use two check valves that are arranged in the same direction and a piston in the center. So essentially when you when you draw ferrofluid in, it's going to pull from the lower check valve. And when you push it out, it's going to go out the upper check valve um, because the resistance to flow is aligned in the same direction. It's very much like a rectifier in, in circuitry, if you're familiar with diodes. So it's going to work the same way. So this is another version of a pump. It's something that we would like to experiment with. It's something that we could compare the performance of this versus uh, the one with the, the cycles that we just looked at. So in this case, it's Robert Reed, I'm the technical lead, and then Asmi Shersat is going to be uh, doing the primary experimentation here. Um, this has not gotten started yet. We're still defining the experiments, um, but that will be uh, starting up uh, in the near future. All right. So with that, that's everything I have on the update for how the ferrofluid experimentation is going at Public Invention. I don't know if there are any other questions or if anyone has comments on, on our progress or uh, suggestions for other things we should look at. Yeah, I have a question. Megan, sure. So what would be the application of this project as you refine the experiments to kind of collect data and better understand this tool? The goal is that, like I mentioned at the beginning, these things don't require moving parts. And hopefully we'll find that they can scale as well. It seems like they should be able to scale. And so doing things like experiments uh, at a chip level, like doing very uh, like micro experiments uh, on a chip, for instance, or um, things that need to be extremely reliable or um, things of that nature. Uh, the, the goal is reliability, and the, the hope is that it can be uh, a nanoscale type thing. I have a follow-up question. Yes, please. So do you have any interest in maybe the microfluidic pump system world? So like right above nano, because I think nano is going to be a lot smaller, maybe mm -hmm. comparative, but I know with like pneumatic systems that exist on the market or that you can purchase for a microfluidic system. And I think this could be a good application of um, using it kind of as like a, an agent to move forward certain solutions, like, a, like you can nebulize certain gas and fluids to push them through. So I could assume that like maybe you can inject the prayer fluid and see it move in relationship to other things. Sure, that sounds like a great application. Also, fortunately, you can create electromagnets in a very small form factor uh, as well. And using those to control ferro fluids sounds like a great application. I might go ahead and stop the recording and then Sounds more great. people might feel comfortable to ask more questions. Sounds good.